All right. Greetings from St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. So happy to be here with Dr. Gloria I. Joseph. And I want to, first of all, the reason why we're here is just because Dr. Joseph is one of many feminists that I love, and I'm really honored to be able to engage with her in dialogue, and particularly as we also celebrate and commemorate the 80th birthday anniversary of mother, teacher, black feminist, lesbian, warrior, poet, Audre Lorde. I want to just give a little background information for those of you who do not know who Dr. Joseph is. Um, first of all, it's, for me, I am sitting with a living legend. That's I'm very clear about that. I was clear about that before I arrived to St. Croix, but I'm beyond a shadow of a doubt clear. Um, her, the work that she has done throughout the world has, I realize, has really paved the way for me, for the Feminist Wire, um, just for so much to exist. Uh, she is, I, I am defining her as a radical black feminist, scholar, activist, educator, um, mentor, just, you know, all around renaissance woman. She um, received her PhD from Cornell University. She is a professor emeritus at, from a Hampshire College. Prior to that, she was a founder and co-director of the Che Lumumba School. She was an associate professor at UMass at Amherst. She has um, was an assistant dean at Cornell, was very much involved um, in the historic takeover when black students took over Cornell in 1969. Um, I mean, we can just go on and on. In addition, she has just authored many articles, uh, authored books um, around uh, just destruction of the planet in terms of when we're thinking about what happened to her during Hurricane Hugo in 1989. She did a photographic essay with Dr. Janetta Betch Cole on women in the Caribbean. Um, she has, um, I can just go on. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of say, but I just really want to give a sense, and we're going to get into some of these issues. So I wanted to give some background information, but true to form, Dr. Joseph is going to introduce herself. Okay. Thank you very much for you and all those responsible for this interview, because uh, the Feminist Wire is a very important, um, I think it should be called practically, hopefully, an institution in terms of... Um, women's movements. So let me briefly just say that um, I am a proud Virgin Islander. Both my parents are born here and I have lived in and I've relocated from the States to St. Croix for the past 35 years. And I'm currently living in an area called Judith's Fancy with my partner Helga Emden and we have a very lovable friendly dog and I'm I must say that before Isha came, she told me she had almost like a phobia of fear of dogs. And I said, well, maybe this dog will, <laughs> will help you. And I can't say that he um, cured her phobia, but there was no indication of her, of Aisha, having any fear of this dog. So I think that's a good omen to show the positive vibes of uh, St. Croix because this dog just seemed to love her and she, I don't know, did you love him back? I did, I mean, I'm really surprised because I'm like one somebody who does not want to, I mean, if I see a dog, I'm like running in the opposite direction and now I'm like, hey, Remus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was indeed a major positive welcome to St. Croix. St. Croix, you know, is this little nine by seven island and sometimes we, don't get in touch with what's going on in the States, but I have my uh, little quartet of people that um, I call them, they, you know, they're like a reality check. So, you know, I keep in touch with um, my little quartet. It's like Sonia is, you know, Sanchez, Janet Cole, and Zala Chandler, her husband, and sometimes I want a reality check of what is really going in the world. I'll call and say, is this so? And uh, that's my little connection with the outside world to St. Croix. The other, I think, uh, another um, landmark, a major contribution to the feminist movement, I would say, is the St. Croix Women's Coalition of St. Croix, the Women's Coalition. And that in itself is an interesting story. It um, began, it took place in 1981 
when I received a minor grant from the Humanities Council and organized the very first Women Writers Symposium in the, in the island, in the Virgin Islands. And I managed to have four prominent women, Advian Rich, Michelle Cliff, Tony K. Pambar, and Audrey Lord as the four women who were members of this Women Writers Symposium. And the result was fantastic. Every night was held at the, at that time it was a college at Virgin Island, now it's the university, and each night was packed, and it was a great deal of excitement. And the fourth night, when Adrian Rich read her, did her a presentation on racism and sexism in the women's movement, but was, when she finished, there was so much excitement in the room that um, Professor Roberta Knowles stood up and said, what are we going to do with all this excitement here? And to the form, Audrey Lord stood up and said, get a sheet of paper, those interested in continuing this, sign up and have a meeting. That was done. The group met the next week and that was the formation of the Women's Coalition of St. Croix. And they, um, it is considered a model for grassroots women's feminist movement. And that is, that, that's very critical, the fact that it is a um, women's organization that started with a grassroots organization. And at that time, the, um, when we met, Mary Mangus was, um, we decided she should be our director. Incidentally, she is the mother of the very dynamic Mia Mangus, who's a dynamic activist, who was raised right here in St. Croix. Maybe that's where she got some of her dynamism from. And um, so Mary Mingus worked almost without salary for years. And later she was joined by a co-director, Clemma Lewis. But uh, a great deal of credit must be given to her. It remained for operating an organization that dealt with women's, with violence against women. And since that time it has grown to a, a very, very uh, needed and respected organization. So. Um, that's about the size of um, what I want to say in terms of my life in St. Croix. Oh, I have to say that when people say, what do you do in St. Croix? There's three things I do, major things. One, write. Two, play golf. Three, garden. And that keeps me balanced, because once you keep your hands in the earth, that's a good source of being balanced. My favorite produce is basil, as you've seen, basil all over the place. Right. It's amazing. And I want to say that Mia Mingus is, was uh, one of the feminists we love in the uh, Feminist Wire in December of, um, of 2013. So it's just wonderful in terms of the connections, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for Mia, but I, I definitely think the environment and the yeah. interactions as well as her own amazing, incredible work that she's done mm -hmm. and does on the mainland. It's very powerful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like to... Um, segue into talking about education. Um, just really would like to get uh, some of your thoughts, particularly, you know, many of us, not all, there, I mean, we're a, a wide range of people in the Feminist Wire um, who have relation, we all have interesting relationships with the Academy. Some of us are there as full-time professors, adjuncts, others of, of us come in as cultural workers and brought in as independent consultants and Others of us have nothing to do with it, but just kind of interested in your thoughts about the state of education today. Okay, now my background in education is um, jam-packed in the sense that I have taught on um, the junior high level, high school level in the states, community colleges, universities, and colleges. I worked overseas for three years with the American um, schools that were stationed over there as a school psychologist and a reading specialist. And in the States, when I was in um, Amherst, a group of us started the Chatham, <coughs> Chatham Mother School for Truth, which was a private institution. And um, throughout the years, of all, of, of all the time I've spent education, I can flatly say, that there has to be a conspiracy as to why Johnny can't read. There's absolutely no reason in the world why Johnny, you know, the phrase can't read, except that it has to be delivered. 
there's so many, been so many, um, um, where should I go? Well, people have written, you know, programs and studies, et cetera. For example, um, Ken Clark, who did the doll study, and his wife, Mamie. During one summer, they took a group of students who couldn't, um, who had problems reading, and in the summer, they, they brought them up to grade level. Now, that procedure that they used was put up on the shelves. It was never used again. And I trained them on the School for Truth. We took students who came and the parents said, well, they can't read this, they have, you know, they need to be on Redolin. Once again, within the year, those students were reading, you see. So it's not that they don't have the material, it's not that they don't have the knowledge, but it's just not applied. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no reason. It, it, so many programs, so many different methods of teaching youngsters, if they have the different type of problems they have, you know. Some children, you know, need um, more of a tactile method of, of learning if they have problems, you know. But basically, I'll just repeat, there has to be a conspiracy and a real reason why the schools are not, are not, when I, most of the public schools, why they're producing and, and graduating youngsters who can't read. You know, when I interviewed uh, Elizabeth Lord Rollins, we talked about that and not about children not reading and then she also had cited, not necessarily in the Feminist We Love interview, but I've heard her cite this around and people, prison, anti-prison industrial complex advocates talk about how now prisons are being developed based on reading levels of third graders. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, and then we now know that the prison industrial complex is, it ha is replacing enslavement. So it's mm -hmm. all this free labor. So, I mean, I think I live in Philadelphia and we're having these brand, brand new prison bill where they're going to have a school in the prison. You know, mm -hmm. so all this money that there are millions of dollars they're putting in the prison that we could be doing in the education system. So it just really underscores what you're saying mm -hmm. about that there is a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, when there's a method like Paulo Freire, we say we use a method called conscientiality. It is with the peasants and those in poverty who couldn't read. And he chose key words like struggle, revolution, that, and they were beginning to learn to read at such a pace that the government declared and found some reason to stop him. Mm -hmm. See, these things are going on all the time. You find in New York City some of the schools that some persons who have started a type of teaching that would be successful, they'll be funded, then the funding will stop or something will stop. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, just ask yourself, if you take the average youngster, give him some books and a teacher, how could he not learn? They're not born um, with an inability to learn, they're born with the ability to learn. Mm -hmm. They have a curiosity drive, which is stifled out of them in most kids. So um, if, if you put the educational system in the hands of persons with the perspective that we have, the problem would be, I won't say totally solved, but it certainly would be an improvement mm -hmm. in terms of reading. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, uh, as Frederick Douglass said way back then, you teach a child to, re to read, teach the people to read, and that's a threat. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you and in the, And also in the school systems, the way students are taught there's an absence of analytical thinking and critical thinking. They're just, you know, material information is shoved in and out. It's not even a good banking system because the banking system, at least you get interest when things are put in, but you don't even get interest when they put this little blue book in and what did you learn and what did you um, take in, push out. The absence of analytical thinking. If they had that, if that was taught in the schools from grade one throughout, these TV commercials would be, they wouldn't be effective because they would be able to analyze what's being said and realize that's not true, it can't be true. You know, drink this and you'll get this, do this, you'll get this. You just stop and analyze it. No, that's, that's not true because how many of the factors are not being included in the analysis of what you're saying? You see. So um, that's another um, comment I have on in the educational system, the lack of um, critical analytical thinking. And, and let me just also say, what is considered a good school? Now, when I was teaching at Hampshire, and the students would say, 
oh, uh, how many students came from a good school, you know, Shaker Heights, these areas? And I said, what did you learn about racism? What? What did you learn about sexism? What? And well, well, what's good about it? What was good? The basic thing that they should be learning? No. Mm -hmm. you see? So it's just, you know, it, it, it just seems to me so simple to look at the root, the root causes of something and then find a solution. Solutions are there. Mm -hmm. But if you want to maintain the status quo, you can't have too many new in interventions because the status quo will change. Mm -hmm. And am I correct to assume that the Che Lumumba school is named after Che Guevara and Patrice Lumumba? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> just even that to have students going to, you know, right, 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 right. just right. that revolutionary mindset. Yeah. It was an algebra that taught a course called um, an alternative school, how to build a, an alternative school with a budget of zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but most alternative schools failed, you know. Mm -hmm. So we were able to use the um, Afro-American Study Center at UMass. They donated space and we had many of the teachers there donated their skills to the um, school and we would have um, sales to get books and um, other materials and I always insist that we didn't have to buy things like the dominoes you make them and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's very successful. Mm -hmm. That's just one example you see. So I, I'm, when I talk about education I'm talking from experience. One thing I really just want to touch upon briefly um, is global travel, um, particularly, you know, for those of us who are able, recognizing that many of us are not, but just the importance. You've had such extensive experience living and uh, traveling um, globally and engaging with peoples of the world mm -hmm. and um, just want just how that has influenced your work, your politic. Not only influences how it happened, because I certainly could not afford to pay to travel to all the travels I did. And most of all my travels throughout my educational career was done, for example, as um, working as a army a civilian with the army. That was how I got overseas for three years, and it was two years in Germany teaching there. And this third year, I resigned. I said Paris a home, and Paris was a choice spot. But um, the um, administrator came to me and said, um, "You've got." Uh, you get, you've got Paris, I said, but I already signed my papers to resign. He said, we'll get rid of them. And this was my really first hand experience with, you know, we're puppets on it. We're, we're chess pieces because other faculty members who had um, resigned, once you resign, that's it. But they needed a school psychologist in those schools. So, and I was the one available, so that's how I, you know, I got that job. So. As a um, is that when you translated also from Mahila? Yeah, oh yeah, that's when I was <laughs> had a great time there because we, um, you know, we were young teachers there and we traveled all over. Every time we had a break, we traveled. We go to the um, you know at Easter time for the um, Easter. Um, it's not a parade where they um, march through the towns with the carrying a cross of, and um, went to. Um, you know, the Matterhorn, we'd ski down the Matterhorn with one, <laughs> one ski, all sorts of things that young people do at the time, you see. And um, we took advantage of all the opportunities that happened, like when, um, for example, Edith Piaf was doing her last show. We'd go to see that. Haley Jackson was singing this place. We'd go there. So I just took advantage of all the opportunities available. The Passion Plays were there at that time. So we went to um, Austria to see the Passion Play. So the, um, in the 60 Olympics, it was the event, and went to see the Olympics there. So um, that was, those three years is how I was able to get to um, see a great deal of Europe. She used to live in Paris for a year, and Germany for two years. It was right outside of Heidelberg. And the, my other experiences came, for example, with the, um, American Friends Society, they would um, have trips to um, China and we required someone, they wanted someone of color and someone of working class. So that enabled me to go to China, you see. With uh, Cuba, they had the first educational group to go and I was teaching at Hampshire and the president was unable to go so her husband asked me to go. So I was always in the right place at the right time. and. 
had the credentials and was uh, you know ready and available. So that was how I was able to um, do that type of travel with the um, in Egypt. No, I was I met her, and she was very impressed and invited me to the Arab, Arab Women's um, Conference in Egypt. So it was through invitations, you see, because as I said, I couldn't afford that kind of travel. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell students, you know, also like with the, with the Peace Corps, you know, if you get to the Peace Corps and you can see the world and travel. I wasn't in the Peace Corps, but I was a Peace Corps um, evaluator for students interested in going to the Peace Corps, you know. And, you know, the value of travel is such that I think that, back to education, it should be a requirement that every student travel to have an experience of being in another country. Mm -hmm. To see the different values, you know, and to see the different cultures. And it, it wouldn't be that costly, it would just build it into curriculums. Each, you know, when you set aside money for schools, include that. Even if it's, you know, St. Croix to Puerto Rico, it's just, you know, New York, Central America, someplace, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's the values, you know, it's, um, you, know, you can't, um, immeasurable, the differences, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, those are some points I want to, you know, make when it comes to education, because yeah. everything's so connected, we can talk about travel, we can talk about education, we can talk about Whatever you talk about it has to be connected with something else. You're right. It's That's what that reminds me when it comes to um, disciplines in colleges. There was this uh, nun, very brilliant nun, Sister Maria Augusta, and she used to always say, there has to be a conspiracy as to why they have disciplines separate. There's no way you can teach sociology unless you teach <laughs> anthropology or no way you can even math, science. You have to, they're interdisciplinary, they're all connected. So, you know, academia, you don't want to keep the strict, the strict, the strict. No, 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 no. They do it for a reason. As she said, that's a big conspiracy, you know. Mm -hmm.